the markets at Merger Market. I have worked at Merger Market for over 17 years, covering, covering public transactions for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa region. I will be your chair for the day. Firstly, we would like to thank our lead strategic partner, Altamimi & Co, and our lead banking partner, HC Securities and Investment, strategic partner, EY Prothinen, and our sponsors, Donnelly Financial Solutions and Intralinks for their input and support in producing this forum. We have over 200 senior delegates registered today, providing ample opportunity for networking outside of the panel discussions. You would have received notifications to the networking tool available to you to set up meetings with other delegates. Uh, you will also notice camera crews filming throughout today's event. These are both from the media and our own event crews. Video clips will be posted on the event website in the coming days. Slides also will be on the website. Slides shown during the panel discussions will be accessible on the website too. Um, I'm just going to give you a really very, very brief uh, summary of M&A activity in Egypt. I think uh, it will be expanded upon in the panels. Um, according to merger market data, M&A in Egypt this year so far has reached 1.5 billion US dollars compared to just 389 million US dollars for the whole of 2017. This year there have been 14 deals so far versus just 10 for the whole of 2017. This was driven by significant deals in the energy, mining and utility sector. We have also seen the re-emergence of private equity transactions. Uh, last year we recorded none, but this year we have had transactions totaling 110, US dollar, 110 million US dollars. The most significant of these was EFG Hermes' acquisition of four Talab Mustafa Group schools worth 1 billion Egyptian pounds. Um, other notable private equity transactions include Helios Partners' acquisition of TK Mobile, Compass Capital's acquisition of Monion for development and trade, and BPE Partners' acquisition of Tamil Group. I'm just going to very, very quickly run you through the agenda for today. Um, our first panel is on M&A deal outlook in Egypt. Um, our deal makers on the panel will offer their insights into what is driving deal activity and their outlook. Among other things, they will discuss Egypt's attractiveness as a destination for foreign investment, obstacles to completing deals, and how the flotation of the Egyptian pound is impacting M&A. Our second panel is on sector hotspots. Here we will discuss opportunities in the education and healthcare sectors. Um, as mentioned, EFG Hermes' acquisition of TMG schools was the largest private equity transaction in Egypt, in the Egyptian market this year. The panel will be focused on, on these two sectors and not just where there are opportunities but where private investment is vital to bridge the funding gap and can bring important advancements to the local market. Following this there will be a 30 minute networking coffee break and then our final panel is on the state of private equity in Egypt. Here we will discuss issues both political and economic faced by private equity investors looking to invest in Egypt and the North Africa region. And then we will conclude today's event with a lunch where you again will have the opportunity to network with your follow delegates. Finally, just before we kick off, uh, a couple of quick housekeeping points. Um, press and media present today, please seek permission directly from each speaker if you would like to quote them on anything that they have said during the panel discussions or in the networking area in any of your reports. Um, please, everybody, turn their mobiles to silent. And also, uh, we have a very packed, interesting agenda to get through today. Uh, we kindly ask for everyone's help in keeping to the timing specified and promptly come back to the panel sessions after the networking break. And with that, I would like to invite Mohamed Gup, partner and head of Corporate Commercial Egypt at Tamimi Co. to introduce our first panel. Uh, 
identity served uh, as the head of investment banking in the AMG until uh, 2016. Um, our second uh, okay. Ahmed is Ahmed Sobhi. Ahmed is a member of the Dallas senior management team. Um, he is responsible for sourcing, executing, and monitoring investments. Ahmed has returned to, to Egypt after uh, a career with Morgan Stanley. Uh, is the hub, uh, has 100 million uh, uh, of assets under uh, management. It's focused on value, being a value added partner for companies with growth potential uh, across the country. Our uh, third, uh, Ahmed, is Ahmed Abusui. Uh, he heads the private equity arm of HC Securities. HC uh, Securities uh, Early Investment Banking is a leading investment bank in Egypt and the MENA region. Um, it provides various services uh, ranging from investment banking to asset management as well as brokerage, research, custody, online trading, and most recently private equity. Uh, Ahmed had a long career in the U.S. as a private equity professional. He worked with Lone Star Fund and Silver Peak Partners. And before that, uh, he was uh, uh, involved in investment banking and project finance with Deutsche Bank. And last but not least, I'd like to introduce uh, Sharif Lahdor. Sharif Lahdor is uh, one of the co-founders of uh, Lion Invest Partners. It was established in 2017. Its aim is to uh, raise uh, a growth capital fund, investing in uh, middle and lower middle market businesses across Egypt. They focus on social infrastructure investments with an emphasis on healthcare, education, uh, financial services, and agribusiness. So please welcome uh, our panelists. So uh, my first question is actually to uh, uh, Sophie. Actually, is actually management, and it comes from our DNA. So the half of the team is operational, half of it is, is has a financial background. And I think we, you know, the management piece, if they're good and they can execute better than others and win, will actually, you know, uh, supersede the sector sometimes and and what sector you're playing in. And so we spend a lot of time with management. We try to get to know them and make sure there's alignment, not only with management but with shareholders and and you spend a lot of time on that, and that's where a lot of deals actually uh, will fall through. It's much more about alignment between the shareholders and the private equity and bringing on a private equity that actually wants to help and has a say in, in the development of the firm. And I think the last and most important piece we always look at is exit. So you have to have that in mind before you get in, N not only the types of exits that you can make, who are the players that can buy the company, but also, you know, that sponsor you're working with, he needs to be completely aligned on that exit because if three years down the road he has a different view, uh, you're in trouble. That's generally how we think about it. 
Um, let me pick up uh, from here and ask uh, Ahmed uh, Gindi a question uh, relating to um, sectors. Uh, you've already made three investments in TCB. Uh, do you think, uh, while we're talking about screening and identifying opportunities, is it better to be sector agnostic or it's better <coughs> to focus on specific sectors? Uh, I would definitely agree with Ahmed on that because, again, it's, uh, it's all about you know, management capability that drives effectively your, um, your returns in, in the space. So definitely you can take you know, an, a top-down approach. Uh, you can look at you know, the macro economy, how it's evolving, and we're coming to that later, I guess, in, in the panel, to sectoral analysis, but effectively it boils down you know, to the micro story the ability of this management team to generate abnormal returns that actually supersedes any other advantage or disadvantage in the market. All right. Um, let me ask uh, Sharif uh, a question. Uh, I think you're operating within a specific space in terms of size. Uh, do you think this uh, is, is uh, helping you identify more opportunities or it limits your options? I think primarily most of us are probably operating in the same, same space. And if you look at the market, you have the larger deals um, and then you have the sort of the mid-market to lower mid-market size. And I think on the larger side, it's primarily intermediated market. So you have a network of advisors, investment banks, and help you get access to these larger deals. And obviously, it makes economic sense for them to focus on it. But on our deal size, it's primarily non-intermediated, especially if you start to focus on opportunities outside of the greater Cairo area. And so it puts on a huge effort from us as an investment manager in terms of sourcing and identifying the right deals. But I guess once you do so, uh, it becomes less of a question of valuation because basically you're probably the only party negotiating or one of a few. Um, and so, you know, again, in terms of sourcing, I think it really depends on where you're focusing. Um, we'd like to think that we're focusing on the area that is becoming much more in vogue uh, these days. Um, especially post devaluation, um, and this is where we've been seeing much of the pipeline. Um, thank you, Shri. And uh, finally, to uh, Ahmed on that subject, uh, you've worked as a PE professional both in the West and in, in Egypt. Uh, in terms of sourcing and identifying opportunities, um, how different is it to operate in an advanced market compared to an emerging market, and what are the uh, specific issues you've uh, noticed while? working in Egypt in, in this particular department or phase of the investment cycle? Well, I think, uh, uh, let me apologize for my voice. I'm just uh, shaking off a cold. But uh, in, in the US and in the West, as Sharif mentioned, you'll have most people are financially um, cognizant. So they'll be already talking to investment bankers. And you have investment bankers that are not only cover large caps, but mid caps and small caps. Uh, so it, it, sourcing proprietary deal flow is very, very difficult. Uh, in Egypt, uh, you, it, it's, a, it's a little bit easier to source proprietary deal flow because the market isn't as saturated, but at the same time, you have to really, uh, with Ahmed mentioned, focusing on the management team and making sure you, uh, you, know, you, you have the proper governance and the proper structure in place for the company to grow. So it's kind of a mixed bag if you're looking here versus uh, looking in uh, the West. I, I actually wanted to, to jump in on that. The positive thing, I think, is the presence of advisors. So, so you're right, you have to do a lot of this sourcing direct. But in reality, a lot of these deals, when advisors get involved, are much more serious and end up with uh, you know, a higher likelihood of closing. And it's... Uh, some advisors uh, recognize that and I think recognize the importance of the bilateral relationship and negotiated transactions. I think those advisors we've seen have much higher success rates and, and are able to close these transactions because it's very hard for Egyptian sponsors when they have uh, owners of the businesses. When, when you take them through an entire process and they meet 17 different people and they have to have a really long drawn out process, they actually end up with deal fatigue and they almost don't want to do the deal anymore and, and it becomes much more, you know, all of these people are the same to them versus a negotiated transaction where if they really like the other party, it becomes much more about the partnership and, and they can swallow some bitter pills along the way to actually do the deal. All right. 
Oh, thanks, Ahmed. Be before we leave this subject, any of you gentlemen care to make a concluding remark or comment on, on this phase? All right, moving on to the next phase, uh, which is uh, structuring the transaction and the due diligence phase. I'll start with Sharif because I've worked with him before and he's very diligent. And I'd like to ask him about this uh, and what are the challenges uh, in the due diligence and structuring phase. And in particular, I know you have an emphasis on health and education. And, and those are two sectors where there are a lot of challenges from the regulatory perspective. So would you care to comment on, on that? Sure. I, I, I think every single transaction we probably looked at, I mean, at least most of them, not to generalize, had its own structuring related issues. I mean, again, we're focusing on sectors that regulations and regulatory framework touches it one way or another. The other issue is the governing fact is, you know, you have the law that says one thing, you have regulation that says something completely different, and then in practice it's, it's even more different. And so part of the discussion early on, especially in the types of transactions we're looking at, which are mostly founder-run businesses, uh, they're probably either sole proprietorships, uh, weak corporate structures involves some level of restructuring. I think that's the biggest challenge that we face aside from negotiating transaction value and finding the right value. And the biggest problem is the perception of any time, whether it's by the regulator or by the different parties, is that every time you try to restructure a transaction ahead of closing it, it's perceived that you're trying to evade something. And that type of perception makes it really difficult because sometimes you're just trying to uh, restructure the, you know, the setup in a way that allows you to enforce your agreements much easier, much faster, in a seamless manner. It's not necessarily to evade taxes or to try to avoid a certain uh, regulatory framework or even short circuit. So I think it needs a level of risk, and I don't think any transaction is, um, does not have that type of level. Uh, it really depends on uh, what the risk appetite is how much of that is factored into the valuation early on? Do you have enough of a cushion? Can you take on these types of collaterals? Um, and so I think, you know, in every single transaction, we'll continue to face it. We just have to sum over that, jump over that psychological hurdle. Sure. Um, let me ask uh, Ahmed Subhi uh, a question also related to that. You have uh, some DFI investors uh, in your fund. And uh, a lot of times in this phase, one of the major issues uh, pertains to compliance. Uh, so how do you address that uh, issue uh, in a manner that allows you to conclude the deal while satisfying your internal regulatory requirements? What, what type of compliance, just so we're on the same page? Um, I mean, general uh, licensing problems, taxation problems, um, some other issues, obviously. Uh, and that comes out in the due diligence, and sometimes it affects, obviously, how we look at the transaction. I think, you know, not, not to defend the DFIs, but I, I think, interestingly, this is sort of why they've given us money, is, is essentially companies that have these kinds of issues, if they are willing to work on them and they're willing to get them right over time, I think that's part of the investment thesis of investing in mid-cap in Egypt, improving corporate governance, improving things like environmental, social, and, uh, and adherence to tax compliance and all of that. And I think we, we take a very hard view, obviously, of, of the fact that it needs to be right once we're in. At, but clearly, I mean, if you can't find, the, if 90% of the companies you meet in the SME sector in Egypt don't have double books, then there's something wrong. So it's, uh, it's, it's, an, uh, it's not an issue that you have to deal with and, and go forward, make sure that it's all rectified historically and that it, on a go forward basis you're doing the right things. Sure. Um, uh, let me ask Ahmed uh, Tsui a, a question pertaining to uh, deal size and what limitations it puts on the resources you have available for the due diligence exercise because some of the transactions the ticket size are not you know ticket sizes are not large enough to accommodate spending a lot of money on the on the due diligence and it's sometimes difficult uh, to uh, accommodate even in terms of time uh, the due diligence process. So how, how do you think that could be addressed? I, I think that's a good question. I think you need to definitely uh, give, give, you know, give yourself a cutoff in terms of the sizes of companies you're looking at uh, because below a certain size it might not be economical for the fund and for the time of uh, investment managers. 
but, but at the same time, um, you know, we're a deal by deal practice. So we're more opportunistic in terms of our size. And that gives us a little bit more flexibility in moving in and out of bounds where other uh, uh, you know, PE shops might not be looking. But uh, it, you, know, you definitely have to be cognizant of you know, if, if the juice is worth a squeeze at the end, right? Sure. Um, a final question I have is the relationship between the due diligence and structuring phase to the transaction documentation and what kind of uh, uh, securities you can have uh, or arrangements you can have uh, that can protect your investment once you have uh, due diligence findings or is it better to address that at the valuation phase from inception? I'll, I'll take Ahmed's comment on that, Gindi's comment on that first. Sure. I think, again, transaction documentation is all about risk sharing. So once you specify or identify certain risks in the transaction, again, the documentation phase is quite important in terms of allocating risks between the investor and the founder or the, uh, the company's management. Uh, I don't think, again, valuation can be, you know, one tool that you can use in some cases, but in other cases, risks tend to be bi binary. So it's either you accept the risk and try to address it in the documentation phase, or you just have to walk out. Understood. Um, does, does any of you care to comment uh, more on transaction documentation and your experiences uh, in, in its relationship to the diligence and structuring? I think, one f I think one point to make in the agreements, sometimes it's difficult to enforce agreements. Almost always it's difficult to enforce because we're not in the dispute settlement business. We're in the, you know, in the investment management uh, business. And so I think it's very key in any type of documentation that you have safety valves at every single point of a deadlock, um, beyond which then you can part ways. So uh, it's very important that you're straightforward about the types of risks and rewards early on in the transaction, whether it's through the due diligence, because there are some issues that arise post due diligence once you close. And so you have to be ready to address these. And, and the agreement is one way to try to sort of uh, reignite or ignite these types of discussions. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned that, Sharif, uh, which raises uh, a question that I have for all of you, actually. Uh, it's been very common with a lot of uh, private equity players, especially uh, that are set up uh, as uh, offshore in, in the first instance. Because of uh, enforceability issues and because of other concerns, uh, to require that the investment is offshore, especially if uh, there is a minority continuing stake for the promoters. Uh, do you think this practice will continue, or do you have uh, more <coughs> confidence uh, in terms of enforceability of uh, Egyptian law uh, agreements uh, and the like? It's okay. Do you care to comment on that? I it's an interesting one because I think we've had this discussion many Definitely. times. Definitely. Uh, to, till, till now, I think we still are comfortable, much more comfortable with the offshore uh, structures and, and the investments being offshore and the agreements being between uh, offshore entities. I think over time, there has been progress in, uh, in Egyptian law. It's more recently the recognition of uh, shareholder agreements and and there are a lot of ways that you can get around it and get a lot of things into uh, Nizam al uh, of the company. Uh, that said, today we're still, we're still there. I would say if, if more is done or you can see more precedence of Egyptian uh, shareholder agreements, uh, shareholder agreements under Egyptian law with Egyptian courts educating in, in the favor of the private equity, I think, yeah, yeah, we're the minority investor. I think you will see a lot of people find it much easier than to do deals in Egypt onshore. Sure, thanks, Ahmed. And, and one final question I have maybe to Ahmed Dsui is, uh, what difference does it make in the risk assessment profile and how do you address it in the diligence and restructuring as well as in the transaction documentation, uh, whether it's a, a, it's a full acquisition, a minority investment, or a majority investment? And how, how, how different the approach uh, is in those instances? Uh, well. Minority investments, especially uh, in Egypt, are very difficult, right? Because you need to be very, very comfortable with a management team. And uh, having minority rights on paper might not actually translate into minority rights in reality, uh, you know, given uh, the legal framework. But uh, that's not to say they should be precluded. But they, they're, they're just, it, 
you know, a much more difficult structure to put in place and has to really rely on uh, a pretty sound management team. Uh, majority investments would probably be, uh, would probably be you know, easier from an investor's point of view because they have control. Uh, but definitely, you know, have to take both into account and understand the risks associated um, with a particular company and the particular management team or the entrepreneur or whether you bring in a new management team. It, it all depends on the structure of the deal. Uh, but um, going back to that offshoring question, um, you know, even though laws can be archaic here in Egypt, that's not, uh, and, you know, that's not precluding other countries from doing offshore deals. You'll, you'll see in the States, people offshoring a lot of deals as well, and in the West. Um, and it's not really, you know, it, it, you can think of it as like a race to the bottom. You want, you want the best uh, terms you can get and the, and the most advantageous tax environment for your investors. So, um, I, you know, it's, I wouldn't say that's only an, an Egypt phenomenon. Um, let us stay with you, Ahmed, and, and um, one very interesting subject uh, as we're talking about M&A and M&A outlook in particular is uh, the exit. Um, so what are the main challenges, and I think Sophie mentioned that you should even look at the exit when you're making the investment from the beginning. So what are the main challenges uh, in terms of uh, exit and how can they be overcome and how can you plan for them from the beginning? Well. Um you know that expression that says don't put the, the cart before the horse? Well, you can forget about that when you're talking about private equity. Um, you definitely have to put the cart before the horse. You have to think about the exit at the genesis. And you need to, um, you need to be focused on who your exit is going to be, whether it's going to be a sale to a strategic or financial, uh, whether it's going to be an equity exit, like an IPO, or whether it's some type of a, recapitaliz a recapitalization, like a dividend recap or something like that. Uh, but every, you know, the, the ideal scenario is to sell to a strategic because they would be willing to pay the highest price because of the synergies they can extract. Uh, but that might not always be the case. And uh, especially w for us operating mostly in the mid-cap space, uh, you know, to, get, to get that company to a size where it's advantageous to be uh, you know, an equity offering is going to be very difficult as well. So uh, exit is, you know, it, it, you know, really, really drives the whole process. So if the exit doesn't, you know, if you have a good exit strategy from the beginning, you're going to walk away from the deal. Uh, but, um, and on the last point, uh, the last form of exit, a recap, that's not, not really common in this uh, here. And, and at the same time, uh, you know, people kind of shy away from financial complexity and, and when you're dealing with entrepreneurs here, usually simplicity is key. Uh, so that would be my uh, notes. Uh, thank you. Um, let me ask a question to Sophie. You mentioned that you need to ensure that there is some kind of alignment between uh, you as an investor and the management uh, that probably stay on in most of the investments you make. Uh, how can you achieve that from the beginning? I think it's straightforward. There's no magic to it. You have to invest in a company or work with a management team that is ambitious, that believes in that plan, that is ambitious and believes in that plan and wants to stick around to see that plan through. And so what you do is you basically introduce things like ESOPs, other types of incentive plans to make sure that that management team is aligned and can stay. And even in businesses that are sponsor owned and sponsor managed, uh, where the sponsor is the senior management, we introduce these ESOPs to the rest of the management team to make sure you have a deep bench. You have a business that is sustainable when we sell it to the next buyer or the one after. And I, and I think that's a very important part of what buyers look for when they come. If you're offering them a, an entrepreneur, you know, after four years or five years of private equity ownership and you're showing them just a the guy that you partnered with, you're probably in a bad place when you're trying to sell the business. Um, uh, thank you, Ahmed. Uh, question to Gendi. You have a strong... Um, can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, a question to Gendi. You have a strong background in investment banking and one of the exit routes is the public route. 
Okay, one of the one of the exit routes is the public route. Uh, so, uh, what are the challenges uh, currently uh, facing uh, taking co companies public, especially in light of the recent uh, IPO? I think you commented on on that in an article. So, can you can you mention uh, some of that? And what are the implications, not from the regulatory side at all? What are the implications for private equity investors? Sure. Uh, I think, again, the capital market is still uh, needs a lot of development. Mind you, again, today the market capitalization uh, of the market in Egypt is below 20% of the GDP. That's very low in terms of international standards. So that's, again, one, one area that will develop definitely over the next five to ten years. More importantly, I guess, is, again, in terms of the mid-cap size, I don't think, again, flotation will be always the first option that will come to mind. Actually, I like the way that the market is shaping up today between the different players and how, again, today there are opportunities that are starting to open up, moving the asset from one financial sponsor to, to the other. So, again, the ecosystem that wasn't there three or four years ago is starting to build up, and I guess this will be the main exit scenario uh, for uh, most of the mid-cap investments. This being said, again, the capital market remains a very important tool. Mind you, in 2005, 2006, the cycle of flotation started with government-owned uh, entities. In 2014-15, the cycle started with privately-owned companies. So again, the market is changing. But I th still think that, again, that the uh, government flotations that should come to the market within the next year or two will be very important in terms of adding size, in terms of attracting new international investors that today will not invest, for example, in privately owned companies that have a market capitalization of $50 million. No, you need, you know, the $300 and $400 million to open up the market, and then you give the chance to smaller players to attract the same class of investors. Uh, Sharif, do you have any final concluding remarks on the exit uh, aspect? I think generally, generally when we look at the exits, uh, the key governing thought is how can we protect ourselves on the downside? Because if the business is doing well and you're able to create value with time, even if you have to sit on it for a little while and sort of weather a cycle or, or what have you, I think it's still a good asset and eventually you'll find the right buyer. But the, the biggest issue is on the downside. And that comes back again with the way you structure the transaction, whether it's local or offshore. Uh, the biggest problem again is structuring it offshore does not necessarily guarantee enforcement because you could have an offshore setup and a certain documentation that guarantees certain valves, but at the local entity, you know, if you're into a dispute, uh, they're completely disconnected. And so again, we try to address these back to the alignment issue. I think the first question we have, again, based on the transactions we're looking at, which are primarily founder on businesses, how are we going to ensure our exit? And what type of discussion are we going to have from day one with regards to that? And what sort of are the, you know, the given back and forth between us and that partner? So, you know, the key issue for us when we look at the exit is primarily protecting ourselves on the downside. Fantastic. Uh, when we talk about M&A deal outlook, I think one of the, in Egypt, one of the main questions is what the impact of the devaluation has had on M&A transactions, what the impact of other governmental reforms, a lot of legal reforms, a lot of tax reforms. What has uh, this impact been, and what do you think is going to happen in the next phase? I'll ask the question to Ahmed Gindi first, and then we can take comments from everybody. Sure. Uh, again, I think we're all emotional when it comes, again, to discussing macroeconomics, so I'll try to stick to the facts. Again, investor sentiment is very important, but uh, sticking, sticking to the concepts uh, will help us again understand the importance of what has been achieved and again the few challenges that remain to be addressed. So just to give everyone you know a brief overview over the next, uh, sorry, let's start with what happened. So again the last couple of years saw an, a huge improvement across uh, a number of macroeconomic indicators. If again Let's take three of them just, you know, to, to give you the full picture without getting into too much details. I would say, again, number one is the narrowing uh, current account deficit going down from 6 and 6.5% 6 to 3 and 2.5%. And that's very important in terms of macroeconomic stability. The uh, net foreign assets of the CBE 
and the banking sector moving from a negative territory, from negative $10 billion to a positive $10 billion in just a couple of years. And again, that's the stability you're seeing today in the exchange rate regime and we're seeing in the dollar market, uh, be it within banks or uh, with the companies we've, uh, we've looked at and we've invested in. And finally, um, again, if you look at GDP growth, because again, to, for this country to achieve 5% GDP growth amid the inflation uh, pressures, amid the uh, significant reforms that have taken place gives you an indication of how div diversified and solid the market generally is. This being said, again, it was a bright start, but uh, again, emerging market, uh, I wouldn't say crisis, but emerging market uh, challenges have started to appear across all uh, similar markets, not only in Egypt. And for that, uh, again, to be mitigated, I think investors, including ourselves, will be looking at you know, a few factors over the next year to determine how quick they can scale up their investments. I would say, again, you know, among those factors are the continued government commitment to reforms. Again, it's been painful since it started in 2016 to us as individuals, to most of the companies we've looked at again. But it's the last mile and we have to show commitment and we have to take the heat of whatever if, uh, is left in the reform program. Second, I would say again, flexibility in the exchange rate regime is much more important than stability. I would like to see the same level of responsiveness of the decision makers that we saw back in 2016 and that contributed to this uh, tremendous change in net foreign assets at the banking sector because this is key. Today, just for you to know, the net foreign assets uh, of the CBE remain in a positive territory for the commercial bank. Actually, they have shifted back to a negative territory. So flexibility is key. Third, I would say we need to see the growth model. GDP growth is a very important number, but we need to see this number shifting from relying on consumption and government spend to relying consumption will always be there, but again, to be actually more relying on investment and on net exports. This is the more sustainable and the more important model we need to, to look at. Government spend was key and was very important at a certain point of time to reinitiate the cycle. However, today we need to see the private sector playing a bigger role and we need to see net exports being the main driver of growth over the next five years. Finally, we need to see a strong flow of FDI and of portfolio investments. Again, this is a country that has taken major reform agenda since 2016. We've had uh, some success stories. For example, the solar project in Ben Ban was a huge success. But we need to have tens of that. We need to have, again, the government IPOs. We need to see portfolio investments coming back to the market. So the flow of investments will help all companies we're looking at will help the foreign exchange market and will help actually more investors to restore their confidence and to come to Egypt even if the emerging market uh, scene is not very attractive. Finally, I think some policy coordination is key. Uh, again, in the mid-market space, at least we're seeing, availing industrial land is very important. But it's, it's a choice that the policymaker ha has to make. Do we need the 700 and 800 square meter factories Again, or are they addressing uh, maybe the micro projects? What about you know the mid space that again that wants to focus on exports? Do you have industrial land today at reasonable prices for the 5,000 and 10,000 square meters factories? In terms of, for example, renewable energy today, we've been very fortunate to have you know the discoveries of Zohr and of Noor, the recent uh, the recent discovery. But again, we need to invest this time and to make sure that over the next 10 years we invest in our renewable energy platform so that we don't go back to becoming uh, a major energy importer after 10 years. So again, a lot has been achieved on the monetary and fiscal sides, on the structural side. I think again, it will be very important for Egypt over the next year to take you know, more serious steps uh, on the reform side to make sure that investors, including ourselves and including foreign investors, come back strongly to the market. Today, there is this uh, deal announced by HC, again, where uh, a Thai company has acquired an Egyptian company. We need to see more of this. 
50 million dollar investment that's again that's what the market will be looking at and hopefully next time we meet we'll, we'll have tons of that not only one deal thank you ahmed for this thorough uh, presentation um moving to subhi um what are your comments on, on this? And I, I'd like to address a specific issue with you, perhaps. Um, a lot of times, the companies you invest in, their returns are in EGP, and your investment and your economics are based on USD. Uh, so, and devaluation, especially with the last uh, huge impact, is obviously a concern, perhaps for you, for the promoters. How can you plan for that? Obviously, that's one element, and please feel free to comment on other issues that Ahmed flagged. I actually want to go back quickly to the exit point, because interestingly, if you look at all of Africa, around 40% of private equity exits were back to management, were back to founders, and 60% only was strategics, IPOs, and uh, private equity exits. While you look at Egypt's history, it's 90% strategics and private equity exits. It's because Egypt is higher on everybody's radar in terms of strategics outside of Egypt. When they look at it, they look at a large market, more advanced legal frameworks than, than the rest of Africa. So I think that we are at an advantage. We see strategic interest for some of the investments we've made already. And so I think strategics are still there and they're still looking at Egypt and, uh, and are still interested. And it's a result of those reforms, uh, I think, that Ahmed was mentioning. In terms of the US dollar to EGP point, uh, obviously, you start with the sourcing of the deal question. Can you find investments that are you know, more export focused or can, uh, you know, can withstand the dollar change, the devaluation? So can they pass on the increasing cost to consumers? And will they have sustainable demand in that case? I think that's a very important element. And then you have to take a macro view We've taken a very long-term view on Egypt, what's been the devaluation on a regular basis since the 1960s, and we, and we think that's still going to be the case unless something major happens in the net export uh, you know, position of Egypt. I think fundamentally, you should see a devaluation as long as you're still in the place where your, uh, cap uh, your current account deficits are where they are and where your debt levels are, are where they are. And I think the debt point brings us to I think we view that the government will continue to find ways to raise revenues uh, and needs to continue to find ways to raise revenues over the next few years. So, you sh so we expect that to still be a burden on some of the companies and on some of the companies' profitability. But that's part of doing business in Egypt. And, uh, and you make extremely good returns even when you risk weight them to, uh, versus that. And, and these investments that the government is making make doing business much easier. So things like the infrastructure spending, the, the roads that are being built, they're reducing transportation costs in some cases in, uh, in some of our businesses, making it easier to transport between certain points and, and others. So it, as a wash, I think it's a positive. I think wh what's happening in Egypt is positive and we view it positively. I think if the government continues to be committed to reform and to turning to private investment, we, we should be in a much better position in two or three years. Moving on to Ahmed, uh, obviously, please feel free to comment on any of those subjects. But uh, in particular, um, what do you think can be done by the government? Uh, and what do you think the uh, private equity community, uh, along with investment banks, uh, professionals like lawyers, accountants, etc., what can we do to uh, uh, enhance uh, the government reforms uh, from the practical perspective, well, let me let me just comment generally on uh, on, on uh, a couple of points that have been made, and I'll get to that question. Um, I, I I agree with you know uh, we're cautiously optimistic about uh, how outlook looks. There are a lot of positive uh, signs, and uh, you know both of them have mentioned Ahmed and Ahmed, uh, but there's you know there's a lot of uh, clouds still, right? You you know double digit inflation. Uh, yeah, which is probably going to be exacerbated once you um, reduce subsidies even more, and uh, you know move to a negative uh, net foreign asset position for the banking sector. Um, so there are pressures for devaluation, right? But um, and you also have added pressure of IMF wanting to liberalize the currency. So 
central bank's hands are kind of tied behind its back to a certain extent uh, in terms of uh, intense interference. But uh, outside investors uh, like a liberal uh, currency uh, regime. So they can enter and exit quickly and uh, you know, deal with the FX risk. Uh, but having, you know, having dollar denominated in, in, in investors in your fund, definitely there's a risk when you're looking at an investment. You have to be very cognizant of a uh, potential devaluation. As Ahmed mentioned, the valuation has been going on since the 60s, right? Um, so that, that's one thing to keep in mind. But on how we, going back to your question about how we can, um, you know, it, it, it help government with, uh, you know, those positive reforms. The government has done some pretty positive reforms in terms of Investment Act and the bankruptcy law. That, uh, and those are the type of things that make it more of a um, you know, financially sound place for an investment. And I think the answer to your question is more open dialogue between you know, government officials, companies, uh, people in the, in the legal framework and the business framework. So, so laws are not just um, you know, top-down bureaucratic and more, uh, you know, more cohesive in a, in a, in a, in a, with a cohesive dialogue. So that, that would be, uh, you know, just keeping an open dialogue. And I, I think the government is receptive to those conversations as well. So that's, that would be my answer. Thank you so much. Uh, Sharif, last but not least, um, would you care to comment on this subject? And more importantly, how do you feel? We have had a pretty strong year in terms of M&A uh, deal flow and in terms of FDI. Do you think this trend will continue? Um, let's talk about the coming year or two, not a very long-term view. Well, I think just about on the FDI issue, I think the world in general has experienced over the last year reduced inflows of FDI across the board. I think and Egypt has missed its targets of $10 billion, but we still have been the highest in the world over the last year. But, but again, I think on the, and I'm going to talk about how the sort of the valuation and and these types of reforms have affected us. The same way the majority of the population have experienced sort of a social displacement in a way, we've seen transaction displacement. So back to the same point where we're seeing more and more of the smaller size deals, um, it's becoming attractive because valuations have not transitioned the same way the currencies have. So we haven't seen companies that are valued three or four times the way they were before valuations. You know, everybody around the table here, I think they have one way or another foreign inflows from their LPs. And it remains to be a challenge. I think the key issue is to try to live and abide by that risk. Part of it is trying to transact at lower valuations, looking at transactions that are high in growth potential, rich in margin. And I don't think you find anywhere in the world businesses that are trading uh, or making netting 40 or 50 percent margin. I think it's very difficult. So as much as there are sort of cautious optimism, there is a sense of opportunity because you don't see these types of deeds elsewhere. And so with these challenges, I think there comes up opportunity in a way, and, and we're seeing much of that. Thank you, Sharif. Uh, I think now is the time to take questions from the audience. So if anyone cares to ask a question to any of our panelists or generally, uh, ah, question here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mohammed, and thanks for the panelists uh, for a very interesting panel. I just have one question, which is really keeping me always, uh, um, you know, surprised and astonished. You see that we're talking about negative sentiment all the time, yet when we're talking about the numbers and the margins. It's quite, uh, to be honest, um, I'm currently based in, uh, in the UAE and working around the GCC uh, on many transactions. The numbers that are mentioned and the margins and the amount of transactional activity is quite astonishing. So I'd like the panel to just tell us why is there this negative sentiment, yet the numbers are not in line with this negative sentiment at all. Thank you very much. 
All right. Uh, who would care to comment on, on this question, please? Go ahead. Um, well, I think, I think the negative, it's not, I, I'd say it's less negative sentiment and more being cautious and being prudent. Uh, but you're right, and as Sharif mentioned, you're, the margins you're seeing here in, uh, is predominantly because most of industries <clears throat> are pretty fragmented. Uh, you don't have, you, you probably have one or two large players, and then it's a very fragmented sector. And, you know, and I, I'm saying that generally, but that, I've seen that across multiple sectors. Uh, so very, because, because of that lack of consolidation, very, you know, very, very, people are able to get away with crazy margins, right? Um, and at the same time, uh, because of what's happened with the valuation, you can also extract a very good price uh, and, and you know, find companies at very good prices. So yes, it is, it is um, the economic landscape is, you know, let's say cloudy, but uh, you ha you know, there are a lot of diamonds in the rough. You need to, you know, you need to find them. Yeah, I'm sorry. I think this is a very good question. And, it, and the reason I sometimes worry about these comparisons is people look at margins as if they're absolute numbers and they're, they're things on their own. But in reality, it's a reflection of the cost of capital of a country, right? I need to be making 25%, 30% margin to be able to pay for the capex I just bought. So to have a return on capital, I need these higher margins. I totally agree. There are certain sectors where the margins don't make sense. I mean, the, the, there are people who are just, you know, because of the lack of competition, able to extract incredible margins. But, but at the end of the day, some of this, if you look at cost of capital, is justified, and some of the companies are even not doing as well as they should be. And part of the negative sentiment, and we have this discussion actually with a lot of entrepreneurs that we meet, is they've had it so good for so long before that, and then revolution happened, devaluation happened, and they're like, Egypt is going to hell. You know, you know it's, a, it's a very, they, they go like, everything is going wrong. When in reality, he's still making 25% net income margin. But we have to take cost of capital into account when we make these comparisons because it's actually important. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, additional questions from the audience? Uh, all right, I have one final question. Perhaps we can go across the panel. Um, I feel that most of you are giving me the impression that you're all cautiously optimistic. And... Uh, is that true, uh, or uh, you have a different view? Because Sharif mentioned being cautiously optimistic, I think, but the rest of you, no one commented. And the main question of this panel is the outlook. So how do you feel the next couple of years are going to shape up? Can we, st we can start with Ahmed this time. So, so again, I think it was a, a bright start. We'll be facing a tricky year in 2019, just like all other emerging markets, but I remain positive over a horizon of five to seven years, for example. But again, numbers are a mixed bag, and sentiment is a function of expectations, not of what has happened over the last couple of years. I think it's our job. It's not, if, you, uh, if you were to talk to us in private, maybe it's different, but it's, it's your job to be cautiously optimistic because if you're not optimistic, you're not going to make any investments. If you're not gonna, cautious, you're going to screw up. So uh, you'll find that that's probably why we all have this view. I, I, would, I, would, you know, we are, I would say I am cautiously optimistic. Uh, but you know, we, we, we see the long-term long-term uh, value there, given the, the ch reforms and the changes that have been made. Will that continue? That's the question. Sharif, final comment? I, again, I think generally speaking, if you take a much wider view, I, you know, as Ahmed mentioned earlier, the landscape has shaped up pretty well over the last three years. Um, so we have you know, interests on the investment side across the board from early stage incubation all the way to large caps and even permanent capital vehicles. So it's becoming more and more sophisticated. And so as things shape up in the environment we're in, I think so long as there is enough stability generally across the board, um, we remain optimistic. Now being cautious is trying to address these sort of idiosyncratic issues related to changing regulatory frameworks 
that happen overnight where there is less of a dialogue. Uh, but ov in, in, in overall, if you look at the overall theme, I think it's, it's probably a positive theme. Thank you, Sharif. Thank you all. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists. I, I hope it was an interesting conversation. <laughs>